very excited to see Juju, but uh, nobody told me I need to give a speech, so <laughs> uh, I'll do what I can. How many of you have crossed an international border? How many of you have felt frustrated at an international border? <laughs> As a social scientist and a scholar of public law and international security, it's hard not to find borders extraordinarily compelling. Wars are fought over borders. We spent billions of dollars securing borders. Borders are important to Americans. But I want to give you a somewhat more personal perspective. And I want to ask a simple question. What do borders tell us about the world? Now, probably like many of you who have children, I look at this question through the eyes of my own kids. And I remember being in Seoul, South Korea, two years ago with my family. My uh, son was then four years old. And he's this little Palo Alto uh, child, and he's <laughs> walking around fish markets and uh, uh, watching the hustle and bustle. And he's groping for the words that he wants to tell me to explain what is happening to him. And one day, we'd been there maybe three weeks, a light bulb goes off and he looks up at me and he comes up with this sort of earth-shattering revelation. This is different from our land. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it was the Korean War veterans who were protesting the Japanese embassy outside our apartment every day. Maybe it was the explosion of colors in the fish market. But he knew he wasn't in California anymore. A couple days later, I was in the Korean Foreign Ministry, and I had a chance to talk to uh, an individual who worked for the Korean Foreign Service. And he talked to me a little bit about his impression of the United States. He looked out the window of his... 12th floor office and pointed to a yellow building about two miles away. And he said, that is where I went to school. And when I grew up, I was taught that this was a special country because every single person in the country was Korean. I look at your country, he said, and I think there's something very special happening. America is connected to the world. People come to the United States from all over the world. They make their home there. I walked back to our apartment that day thinking a little bit about the two conversations, the one with my son and the one with the diplomat. My son telling me, as a four-year-old, that he's realizing that the world has borders. The diplomat telling me that he's realized that America is special because it can transcend borders. I thought a little bit about asking myself then, how does that play out in a very, very special geographic region? The nearly 2,000-mile stretch of land where Mexico and the United States come together. Here's a picture of that border. Looks like a weird, bad Photoshop mashup. <laughs> I mean, look at it, right? Doesn't take a rocket scientist or a PhD to know when one country ends and the other begins. I want to tell you that in a way, uh, if you've ever been there, you begin to realize that it's a study in contrast, but contrast in two different ways. It's first a contrast in the uh, ways that Americans normally think about what they want at the border. Many Americans want perfect or near-perfect policing and the more gray and greasy reality that is possible on the border. It's also a study in contrast because of Mexico and the United States. Even after NAFTA and trade deals and immigration, lawful and unlawful, the reality is that Mexico is uh, a place where per capita GDP is about a third what it is in the United States you think a little bit about how it plays out, that this place that many, many Americans think of as a site for undocumented immigration is also the most legally crossed border in the world. 250 million inspections or so are performed every single year. Now you look at this border and you think to yourself, how does it work to be a child growing up in that border perhaps? Let's say you live in Mexico and you look across a fence or a river and you ask yourself, maybe 10-year-old to 12-year-old, what are people thinking on the other side of the border? How similar or different are they to me? Do they care about what happens on this side of the border? In that sense, the border is a sort of impromptu political philosophy lab. You could say that that child is also thinking, if he's taken across the border, to look at a museum on the other side. How is it that just a mile away, two museums might exist that tell a completely different version of history. There are people in the here and now that nonetheless take these dueling museums, differences in GDP, 
and tell us that we are heading towards a borderless world. From this perspective, the picture that I have up here is maybe a good picture for the 20th century, but maybe we need different pictures for the 21st. That's a picture of the internet. When I looked at it, I thought it was a science fiction movie. Uh, and by the way, the kids uh, had control of my computer for a couple of hours before I did the slideshow, so if anything is a little too strange, uh, you can blame them. <laughs> but this picture tells you something about the world we're living in. It tells you how it is that people have come to see the world from a different perspective. If you use the internet, maybe it's easy to imagine that the world is not quite as divided by borders or by oceans. You could add to this, of course, global trade. You could add to this security problems that are difficult to regulate at the border, the difficulty of detecting nuclear materials. But at the end of the day, I would argue that before we leap to the conclusion that the border is erasing itself and that the world is converging, we have to look at a few more pictures. So what those colored little dots represent are countries, different populations, different life expectancy, and different per capita GDP rates. And of course, it immediately gives you a sense that these borders that we see on a map also reflect very dramatic differences in institutions. The differences also play out even if countries have similar levels of wealth. Take South Africa, Russia, and Mexico. What these countries have in common is very similar per capita GDP rates. South Africa's life expectancy is 52. Russia's is in the mid-60s and Mexico's is 76. I have a picture up here of Haiti and the Dominican Republic. And you can tell that if you're a tree, you don't exactly feel perfectly fine about being on one side of the border. <laughs> These things are changing, but they're not changing fast enough to conclude that borders are disappearing. And it's important to understand that whenever we say the word citizen, citizenship, we're invoking borders. We're invoking the idea that we are part of a broader community, but a community not so broad that it includes everybody in the world. So when a country succeeds in improving its GDP, in protecting its trees, in protecting its citizens, it's also saying not everybody is equally situated and we don't care about everybody the same way. Borders might allow those national communities to develop, but of course they also have a more challenging side to them. For as long as there has been a border between, say, Mexico and the United States, there was money to be made by crossing that border. A spirited market in illegal spirits once developed. Tariffs were evaded. Drugs, guns are more commonly smuggled today. In some of my research, I describe the organizational changes that occur in illicit networks as they adapt to different changes in enforcement strategies, how they find ways around border regulation, how they launder money in different ways. For our purposes, the important thing to note is that the competition to control the territory that is useful for smuggling can be very violent. There's a picture up here of a neighborhood in a northern Mexican city. In broad daylight, that bus blocks off the street and allows a firefight to break out between two criminal gangs. People die. Changes in criminal enforcement strategy and changes in drug markets and changes in criminal activity have led to big increases in crime in northern Mexico, most dramatically in a city like Monterrey near the north. In the middle of 2009, there were about 20 deaths a month that were drug-related. By 2011, the number had risen to 180 a month. The problems that arise in or near the border underscore not only the complexities of regulating the border, though, but also the fact that many problems stretch across borders. They could involve law enforcement and crime. They could involve environmental protection. They could involve food safety. And the irony, of course, is that as countries take on those problems that involve crossing borders, they often also have to cross a different kind of border, the borders that exist between two different agencies in government. Let me give you an example from a problem I worked on. A great deal of the food that you eat in the United States comes from abroad. It crosses borders. 80% of the seafood, 50% of the fruits. How do you make that food safe? There is no way to do that without getting the customs service and the law enforcement people there to talk to the lawyers and the doctors at the FDA, to work with the trade negotiators at USTR. In this building, in the White House complex, 
People work day and night to try to get these agencies to talk to each other. And let me just tell you, if you think it's hard to get people from across different countries to talk to each other, you should try getting people from different agencies to talk to each other. <laughs> this is a problem that was actually of great interest to uh, this man, Franklin Roosevelt. Seventy years ago, Franklin Roosevelt, who of course grew up uh, far away from any international border, had an instinct for borders and did what he could to get these borders between agencies to be bridged. On the eve of war, as the U.S. was getting ready to go to World War II, Roosevelt had a problem. His problem was that some of the most important programs for him, involving education and public health, social security, were potentially threatened by the fact that the U.S. might go to war. So what he did is he created an agency that crossed borders between domestic and international affairs, between security and non-security, and he melded together defense-related weapons research, civil readiness, civil preparation of uh, defense-related industries with public health, education, social security, and he created an agency called the Federal Security Agency. In doing this, not only does Ro Roosevelt protect these programs from the chopping block, he also created today's Department of Health and Human Services. FDR saw that by crossing borders between the domestic and the international, you could build something new. You could create maybe a more adaptive agency that could figure out the connections between education and public health, between defense and social security. He recognized that what you might call the edge environment emerges at the border between two countries or two jurisdictions. So it can be two, perhaps, with international borders. In Tijuana and San Diego, about 380 miles from here, the group, mainly Mozart, uses classical music to bring people together across borders. Musicians from both countries play together to audiences from both countries. In Dadaab, in Kenya, in a refugee camp not far from the border with Somalia, despite the challenges, refugees find ways of starting small businesses. The man that's in this picture right here is a web developer. He taught himself how to do this on cell phones and has his business in a refugee camp. The fact that these edge communities can develop crossing these kinds of borders might make us feel like even the most tradition-bound institutions in the world could change. And I'm talking, of course, about universities. During the 1960s and the early 1970s, Stanford students were vigorously exercising their right to protest. The building you see here is in Sina Hall. It's a block away from where we're standing. Stanford students concerned about the blurring border between what they took to be the defense establishment and universities, decided to take over in Sina Hall one day. Soon after, three Stanford faculty members, a political scientist, a law professor, and a physicist, pulled together and decided that the students really knew relatively little about how policy was made and how it affected countries across borders. So they started teaching a class on international security, they decided ultimately that that class should become a center that brought together people across different disciplines. And something extraordinary happened. Over time, this center that became so adept at crossing disciplinary borders attracted some amazing people, future cabinet secretaries, future assistant secretaries, future ambassadors. You can see some of their pictures right here. And you can see that their hairdos changed over the course of their careers. <laughs> but their commitment to crossing borders did not. I hope I've convinced you that borders can be some of the most extraordinarily fascinating things to study and to try to understand, that they affect our world. But I haven't shared something else with you, and that is that well before I ever set foot at a university, I was thinking about these issues. Because I was that kid that I talked about growing up on the border, looking across the border. I was born just a few blocks from the U.S. border, grew up in that city, the picture of which I showed with that bus creating that blockade, that scene was maybe just a few blocks from my grandmother's house. And it's true that the U.S.-Mexico border has had its share of heartbreak. Yet that very same border is part of one of the edge environments that I've talked about. You see creativity from local officials fed up with diplomats and finding ways of working together to immunize children. You see teachers figuring out how to educate migrant children in creative ways. You see architects rebuilding quake-damaged structures using an odd and strange aesthetic borrowing from both countries. So the reality is that borders tell us something very interesting. They show us a paradox. 
Borders simplify the world, but they also make things complicated. Borders divide, but they also enable these edge environments to develop. Borders are written down on a map, but they also exist in our mind. My kids don't have much patience when I talk to them about paradoxes. <laughs> Go figure. But they like to talk to me about the future. They ask me questions about the future. And I can't see the future, but I have a strong belief, and I'll leave you with this. What happens in their future will depend very heavily on how they and their generation choose to manage these borders. How they choose in particular to strike one critical balance at the core of so much of what we will have to handle. How to balance this idea of citizenship, belonging to something greater than yourself, but within a bounded national community, with concern that you might have for somebody living beyond your borders who has a life radically different from your own and might not li be living further away than just a couple of feet from a fence. Thank you very much.